what I really wanted to do was provide a few minutes to talk about disagreement and understanding disagreement um, in, in the way I've sort of come to think about this and frame this. And I, I find it sort of a useful explanatory method and I'm gonna have some help with that and I'll introduce Chris in just a minute. But to sort of get into this, I wanna talk a little bit about um, the Shiprock, which is on this picture. The Shiprock is a uh, spectacular mountain that sits in the deserts of New Mexico. It rises 1,700 feet off the desert floor <clears throat> and geologically it's the core of an old volcano. So what you're actually seeing there is the lava core with the volcano part, you know, what, you know, the sort of Mount Rainier part, completely eroded away and what you're left with is that lava core in the middle. Um, but this mountain is an icon for several groups, uh, the first of whom are the Navajo. The Navajo, this mountain sits on Navajo land and the Navajo consider this to be one of their sacred mountains. And in Navajo lore, this uh, is the remnant of the vessel that rescued them from their enemies when, uh, and took them to their current homeland in the deserts of the Southwest. So they worship this mountain, they revere this mountain. It's also iconic for a group of people called rock climbers. <laughs> um, and if you're a rock climber, you're probably already salivating because those fluted walls actually pose um, quite a fun challenge uh, for those who see um, rock climbing as one of their um, core uh, identities. And uh, I, there are even books on sort of 50 iconic climbs and you know, climbs to do before you die and many of them feature the ship rocks. So this is actually um, one of those mountains that, that uh, many rock climbers want to notch uh, in their belt having climbed. The problem is that puts the rock climbers in conflict with the Navajo because the Navajo say you do not climb a sacred mountain, that it desecrates that mountain when you do so. Um, and so what you have there is a core disagreement. And the way I think about these sorts of disagreements is, is you know, what we all too frequently do is we go to the bottom here, which is what should we do about this? And th that's true of almost all of the ethical dilemmas we have. We think about sort of what we do in ethics whether it's an ethics consultation or in the moment on the wards or writing about it for a paper, we, we think about the core of that being coming to some consensus about what we should do. Um, and yet, and if you, you need no further evidence of this than our current political climate, um, it can be very difficult to get people to agree on that. And, and what is really important to understand is that you're not gonna get people to agree about that if you don't understand that, that uh, factoring into that decision about how to respond to a certain situation are two really important things. The first of which I call character and identity and the second which I refer to as vision. Um, now by character and identity, I mean really the answer to the question, who am I? in sort of a very important core sense. What are my role responsibilities? What kind of values does that bring to my life? Uh, and so being a nurse, being a social worker, being a physician, being a parent, uh, being a faithful child, they to many people mean something. Those come embedded with values. A good parent does not behave in certain ways or a good parent behaves in certain ways. A Navajo behaves in certain ways and a rock climber behaves in certain ways and there are pieces of their identity that drive the way they respond to the ship rock. A Navajo stands back in awe because they're a Navajo and this mountain is special to them. A rock climber makes a beeline toward that mountain um, because they're a rock climber. That's part of their identity. It, it, you, you're, no self-respecting rock climber is gonna stand back and look at the thing. They wanna climb it, they wanna get on it. The second piece of this is vision. And by vision, I mean the way you see and understand the world. And we all see the world slightly differently. And that is definitely colored by our identity and our character, but it's also more than that. And um, to illustrate this, I'm gonna bring up a, a colleague of mine, Chris Patan. 
And Chris is one of our security officers. He is um, the regional security manager of Seattle Children's, and he's worked in our organization for the last 13 years. Um, he, I, I consider him to be one of the gems of our organization. I get, have the privilege of working with him in the emergency department and have seen him in action. And um, to sort of illustrate this notion of vision, I wanted to bring Chris up and have you um, hear from him about one encounter he had with a patient in our emergency department. And then I will come back up and, and sort of finish this. So Chris? Testing. So, uh, so um, I have uh, told this story at a few um, on a few occasions um, at Schwartz rounds, uh, some Code Purple meetings uh, to my team for debriefs uh, and trainings. Um, so hopefully, it's somewhat beneficial and relevant. So it was just another happy-go-lucky day in Seattle Children's Security, um, <laughs> and. Um, I was called to a family uh, disturbance in the emergency room uh, where there was a dispute uh, with care um, as is kind of commonplace um, in our world anyway. Um, so I responded, I'm not sure if it was actually a code at this time, I can't remember, I'm not sure if it was a code or just one of those discreet calls, get down here now. Um, upon my arrival, I was greeted by a very colorful individual. Uh, I would, this was the, the father of a patient. Um, and I asked our team to step back, and I entered the room alone. Uh, not often called best practice, but it's often my practice. Um, so I went in the room, and I was greeted by a lot of colorful language. Um, it started with him saying, our greeting was, get out of my face, you N-word. And I'm not here to listen to anything that you have to say. Uh, your security, what do you think you're going to do? F-bomb, this, that, and the other. A lot of colorful language, um, as, again, is fairly commonplace in our work. Um, so what do you do in those moments, right? How do you rationally detach enough to remain calm and see how you can advocate for this individual who's obviously not a great advocate for themselves at this moment, right? So. Um, he continued to say, get out of my face, you N-word, I'm not leaving. And this, this continued over and over and over and over and over and over again. Um, and I let him know that I wasn't going to leave. Um, I was here to advocate for him regardless of whether he was doing a good job of that for himself in the moment. So he then said to me, F you. I'm going to get in your face. So he got in my face. He stepped in my bubble just a little bit. Um, I backed up, gave him some space, and said to him, sir, I'm here to advocate for you again no matter what you say. I'm here to help, and I'm going to help. Then he said, get somebody who's in charge, you effing in, blah, 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 blah. So I took that, and I reflected briefly. <laughs> and then I said to him, well, do you want the good news or do you want the bad news? <laughs> and he said, what? And I said, do you want the good news or do you want the bad news? And he said, F you. I said, well, I'll just start with the good news. <laughs> I said, the good news is that no matter what you do and no matter what you say, as I've stated, my job is to advocate for you, this organization, and the safety and security of this entire uh, environment of care. So I'm going to do so. So that's the good news, no matter what happens. I said, the bad news is, the end's in charge. <laughs> Don't tell nobody. So, so then after that, he did exactly what you did. He laughed. And he said, you're crazy. I said, as are you. I said, now that we got that out of the way, what is it that you need and how can we move into relationship? What can we do? What, it, what is happening? Then he began to tell me his story of disagreement. Then he began to tell me about things that I don't even want to know. I make more friends in Seattle Children's that I never wanted to make. <laughs> OK? 
okay? And it happens every day, right? This, and it's based on being in a relationship. I heard uh, Chris and Ann's before me, I was listening, and I heard a lot of things that resonate with the work that I do every day and the work that we teach our team. Um, and my core values come from uh, learning um, in situations like that how to remain non-judgmental within my bias, right? And this is something that we teach our team. Please remain non-judgmental within your judgments or within your bias. And giving people the right to disagree. Um, I'm a patriot, right? So I believe in your uh, First Amendment rights. He can use that speech, it's okay. The burden of professionalism should not be placed on this individual. He's, he does not work here. So I didn't say it's unacceptable or inappropriate for him to say those words to me. I can find them unpleasant, right? Which I might have, okay? Um, I don't think many people like to uh, get cursed at or called names or things of that nature. That's not what most people like. I actually like it though, it's kind of, I'm kind of different. <laughs> Okay, and the reason I like it is because I enjoy conflict. Who likes conflict? There's a few of us in here, right? Yeah, I see my people. Amanda, yeah, Amanda. So there's a few of you in here who actually enjoy conflict. I'm one of those people because I like conflict because simply this, it provides us an opportunity to get to resolution. That's it. It's just an opportunity to get to resolution. So if we spend the time and and want to go through this conflict willingly and look forward to these opportunities, um, we will have um, a, the, uh, an inroads and a way to build rapport and relationship uh, with individuals who sometimes, again, are not doing a wonderful job of advocating for themselves. And I wanna make sure I'm not using too much time, so, okay. See y'all later. Thanks, Chris. I could probably just stop there, and move on to the next talk. I, I love Chris's story because it illustrates so beautifully how important both um, character and identity and vision are to the way we act and, and the sort of uh, uh, way we work. I, I mean, clearly, um, the way Chris understands his role, I'm here to help, profoundly impacts the way he acts in a situation that I'm not, I, I know I wouldn't be able to act as gracefully. Um, but his vision, the way he sees what's going on in those situations is also really powerful. Um, he sees conflict as an opportunity, right? That's not the way most of us see it. Um, but that allows him to sort of engage a parent like this and work with them in a constructive way. Um, he also doesn't see an enemy there, somebody who has, uh, you know, just called him um, what many people would consider to be unforgivable names. Um, he, he doesn't see somebody who's not part of my group. Um, he sees somebody uh, who needs his help, and he's going to make sure it happens. So uh, it, it's, a, it's a beautiful story that, that shows how powerful these two things can be. Um, now, to give you a clinical example, I want to tell you about a father um, that I encountered in the course of my duties as an ethics consultant. And I was asked to get involved in this particular case, um, which involved a, a dad who had recently immigrated from Russia and would not consent to treatment of his son's newly diagnosed ALL. And um, his reasons made no sense to anybody. He insisted that, um, that we were wrong about the diagnosis um, and uh, really hadn't, nobody had really sort of asked the important questions about, well, why, why do you think that's the case? Um, but he refused to believe his son had, treatment, had leukemia, so he wasn't by any means going to consent to treatment. Um, now, when we think about that case, I, I want to sort of tell you how I would approach sort of an ethical, a case like this from an ethical perspective. And I'll come back to um, the importance of understanding vision, and in particular, this father's vision in a minute. But, you know, the traditional way of thinking about many cases like this is that our primary ethical duty is, is that of beneficence, to do good 
primarily for the patient in this case, and um, seek their good by avoiding the infliction of unnecessary harms, preventing harm, and promoting good. Um, and it's easy for us to sort of frame that principle in terms of we're the ones doing the beneficent stuff. Um, we're the ones being beneficent. But it's true that the medical professions are really forms of applied beneficence, but so is parenting. And, and, and so it's easy to sort of look at a case like this and say, well, the beneficent thing to do here is to make this dad treat his kid, because he's clearly making a decision that's not in his child's best interest. But what, what we have to understand is, that's not the way the dad sees it. He, for some reason, has decided that it is not in his, best, his son's best interest to treat that leukemia. And we need to try and understand how he's seeing this situation if we're gonna to come to any sort of reasonable um, consensus that doesn't involve coercion. Um, and now, when I think about these cases, in pediatrics in particular, I, I, I see we usually, I understand that we usually have two kinds of disagreements. There are parents who request a medical intervention that a clinician doesn't feel is indicated, and there are those who decline medical recommendations. And this father is one uh, of those in that latter group. Uh, and, and here are my sort of in a nutshell recommendations in those cases. So this is sort of me as the formal ethics consultant. Um, when parents make requests that don't necessarily fall into our camp as typical medical treatments, um, and we talked a little bit about this with Ann Fadiman, I, I, I think we should consider accommodating parents when doing so is not gonna harm the child, it's not gonna significantly harm others, and that may be where sort of astronomical costs come into play, as Chris Futner suggested. Um, or where there, there may be some potential for benefit, but it's not been established. We just don't know, so we don't have a lot of grounds for saying, no, you can't do this, or no, we won't accommodate this. Um, that being said, I think it's also appropriate to limit interventions to those within the scope of a provider's practice or standard of care, so that when families are asking us to actually do something to their child that we are not familiar with, um, it's appropriate for us to refuse to do so or, or to refer to somebody who knows more about it. Now, what about a parent like this Russian father who's refusing treatment? Um, the framework within which I see that is really almost more of a legal one than an ethical one, and that is to understand, first of all, that no healthcare provider can treat a child without parental permission without the state's intervention. Um, and there are a few exceptions to this, like true emergency situations. But in a case like this, if you don't have this dad's permission, you do not have consent to treat his son, and your only real alternative is to get the state involved in some capacity, either through a child protective services, child neglect um, holding, or a court order. So our primary tools are clinicians, as clinicians are communication and persuasion. And this is where that vision piece becomes really important. This is where you wanna be as effective at our job as Chris is at his. Um, and diagnosing the reasons for the refusal can be helpful. So we ask a few more questions. We sit and listen a little bit, and it turns out that this father from Russia has at least two relatives he knows of who were initially treated for cancer and proved not to have it at some point in time. Why? Because of a misdiagnosis. So he's now gone from what appears to be an irrational parent to one who actually is being quite rational based on his own experience. And, and we're starting to understand why he sees this particular situation his son is in so differently than we do. We see a, son, a child with leukemia, he sees a child who probably doesn't have leukemia, and we're about to harm with toxic medications. So taking the time to do that diagnosis is important. Now I do have a framework, this is the fire hose, um, in terms of what I think we should, the questions we should be asking before we would go to seek state intervention in a case like this. So, you know, when I go in, I'm the ethics consultant with this particular family, and the question I've been asked is, should we get a court order or call CPS? And 
I'm going to answer these questions in my head because I want to know, is this ultimately one I'm going to push to the wall? Uh, but in doing so, I'm also going to be thinking along the way, is there any way we can avoid this? Because this has got to be a last resort. Um, it's always damaging uh, in some way to trust and to the family and to the child. So the first question I ask is, are the parents, is their decision placing the child at significant risk of harm that's both serious and imminent? And in this particular case, the answer to that is yes, not treating a child with a potentially good outcome leukemia um, will almost certainly result in his death. That's a significant and serious harm. Uh, is it imminent? So the question I asked the oncologist the, when I took that phone call was, how long do we have to work with this family before you think the prognosis worsens? And the answer I got was about a week. Is the interference necessary to prevent the harm? Well, if we can't convince this dad in the next week, then it is necessary to prevent this child's death. Is it likely to prevent the harm of proven efficacy? And we had data to show that this child had an 80 to 90% chance of cure. Um, and is it not associated with a similar risk of similarly serious harms? So a proportionality sort of measure. Um, and I think most people would argue that although uh, treatment of leukemia comes with some downsides. Those are generally tolerable when compared to the other result of not the result of not treating, which would be death. And here's the real important one: um, there should be no less intrusive alternatives. And the less intrusive alternative in cases like this is: can we figure out a way to work with this family? Can we figure out a way, maybe, to change the way this dad sees the situation so that? He now agrees with us about this recommendation and the conflict goes away. Um, because if we can't get through this conflict, um, it's starting to look like uh, state intervention is the answer. And then I have two other tests and, and one of them you'll uh, recognize some similarities with, with um, a couple of the ones um, um, uh, Chris Futner mentioned. Uh, the first is the test of generalizability. Um, usually, not always, but usually, you know, we find that the people we're disagreeing with um, are different from us in some important way. And so the question I always ask, if I have up to this point come to the conclusion that state intervention looks reasonable, the next question I ask is, if this father or family uh, was almost identical to me, uh, they lived in the North Seattle area. Dad is a professor at the university. They're white, middle class, go to the same church. Kids go to the same school. Politically similar. Would I feel the same way? Would I still be willing to take this to court or call CPS? If the answer is no, there's probably some implicit bias and you need to step back and ask whether you're doing the right thing. If the answer is still yes, then uh, you proceed to the next step. And, and I threw the test of publicity in mainly for um, the administrators at institutions. Um, and that is because what I always get is, yeah, but if this becomes public, what, what are they gonna say in the newspaper about us that we forced a father to treat his child? And my answer always is, you know, if you've gotten down to this point in justifying this, you better be able to defend it in the public realm. And, um, it, and, and that's the test of publicity. It, it's, it's really, would you be able to defend your actions publicly and would, be, would you be willing to do that? So let's go back to this dad. Um, so we've got a week, or the oncology team has a week, and what I've said to them is, this is a case that we would eventually get a court order on, but you have a week to figure this out. We are not gonna do that just yet. Um, and the father has told us why he's reluctant to agree with our recommendations. So see what you can do. And um, I have to say the oncologist came up with a brilliant solution and, and it beautifully illustrates the power of vision in this case. Uh, because remember, this dad doesn't believe his child has leukemia. So what the oncologist did on day six, was he took the dad down to the pathology lab and sat him in front of a teaching microscope. And then he put his son's blood 
under the microscope and he sort of started reviewing what he was seeing with the father, made sure he could understand. And then he, he pulled out a pathology textbook and he showed him pictures of normal white blood cells in the textbook and pictures of leukemic white blood cells in the textbook. And they took the time to go back and forth between what he was seeing in his son's blood under the microscope and what he was seeing in the textbook. And the father finally, after doing this for quite some time, the father turned to the oncologist and said, my son has leukemia, we need to treat it. The conflict went away. The, what had happened in that case was his vision was changed in a very powerful way. He now saw leukemia in his son's blood in a way that he understood he could visualize. And, and that was actually literally <laughs> changing his vision. Um, but it shows you how important that is in terms of the way people make decisions. And in this case, it, it left all of us with a family that um, were grateful uh, patients of our hospital who trusted the team uh, because we had not shown them the disrespect of taking them to court, but we had taken the time to allow them to understand where we were coming from and at the same time, in order to do that, to understand where they were coming from. Um, and so the power of vision is a very important one. Um, in his book on moral vision, Katie says, moral differences are not just different choices given the same facts, they're differences of vision. Moral views are less the product of reasoning and more the result of an image, a slogan, and a metaphor. Um, and it's not that moral reasoning isn't important, it's just that the way most of us in real life make moral decisions um, is that we understand things in a certain way. Um, and, 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 all you have to do it, it, is look at any contentious, divisive issue in the realm of ethics, politics, uh, or your home life, and pay attention to the language being used. Um, what you will find is that people who disagree profoundly use very different language to describe what they're talking about. I mentioned what's going on at the border earlier. Um, and I'm not gonna propose a solution to that. But what I want you to notice is that there are those right now in 2018 who are describing every person who crosses that border as a criminal. That is a way of seeing that profoundly impacts the way you treat those people. And it's very different than if you see them as a parent fleeing domestic abuse, political abuse, or something else with her children to try to give them a better life. Vision has a very powerful and profound impact on the way we come to medical um, and moral decisions. So I'm gonna stop there, thank you.